Okay, just a few little housekeeping bits to start with. No doubt you will have some questions for our very esteemed guests today. If you could put them in the question and answer function that should be at the bottom of your screen, um, I will do my best to answer those as we go along and to ask them um, of, of our guests and we'll pick them up throughout the discussion. This is a really kind of informal chat about how excited we all are to return to outdoor swimming from the 29th of March, certainly in England, in, in accordance with the government, uh, with, with the current guidelines. Um, my name's Emma Lewis. I'm National Aquatics Manager for um, Better Leisure, um, and we will be opening some of our outdoor facilities from the 29th, and I'll, I'll take you through which ones are, are coming back a little bit later on. I'm also um, a fairly inexperienced but very enthusiastic outdoor swimmer, um, and for me, the main benefit for me is just the mental health benefits that come with outdoor swimming. Um, I'd like to um, invite the rest of the group to introduce themselves to you all. So Carrie ann can I start with you, please? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Emma, for having me on um, my second uh, webinar with you guys. And the first one was great. So I'm excited to see how this next um, session is gonna go. As with everyone is at home, things going on. I've got a child <laughs> who's eating lunch right now. So she joins in, but <laughs> my husband just arrived now to hopefully take her. So. An introduction from me is, uh, so I, my background is swimming. I was a pool swimmer and then I transitioned into open water swimming around about 2007, just in time for the Beijing Olympic Games. <laughs> um, yeah, for the Beijing Olympic Games. And I went to the Beijing Olympic Games, came back with a silver medal, then threw on to the London Olympic Games and then through to 2016 Olympic Games for the 10K. I also swam in the pool as well in, in Beijing. And uh, retired 2017, and I now coach people. So I'm a, a, an open water coach, but I also deliver coaching qualifications. So I also qualify people to coach open water swimming, um, which has just been amazing. So um, by June, I'll have qualified over 300 coaches in three years, which is just um, a stat that I'm very proud to be part of. Great. Thanks, Carrie Ann. Um, Greg? Uh, hi, I'm Greg White, Professor Greg White. Um, potted history is I was uh, an Olympian, world and European medalist at a sport called modern pentathlon. I started life as an athlete, as a swimmer. Um, I studied alongside that. So I did a BSc, MSc, PhD, DSc, um, lots of letters um, throughout that. I then became the director of research uh, for the British Olympic Medical Centre and led on the environmental conditioning for five Olympic teams, both summer and winter and then went on to become the inaugural director of science uh, for the English Institute of Sport and the Irish Institute of Sport. Um, and I guess from an from a, a open water perspective, I've swum in all over the world uh, uh, in open water. It's a real passion of mine. And, and you may well have seen some of the stuff that I've done with the likes of David Williams. So I coached David Williams uh, to swim across the English Channel and Gibraltar Straits and the length of the Thames. Uh, James Cracknell, Davina McCall, et cetera, for sport relief and comic relief. So I've spent a lot of my life submerged. Thanks, Greg. I'm sure some more of those stories are going to come out throughout the course of the next hour. That's what we're hoping for anyway. Uh, and Simon. Hi. Yeah, thanks very much. So so I haven't been to the Olympics. Um, I never even got close, uh, but I, I do publish Outdoor Summer magazine. And I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, and yeah, really proud how how that has grown and how that's developed with the growth in open water swimming, especially in the last few years and, and last summer, uh, how outdoor swimming really seems to take off last summer. And, and so many people, I think because of the situation we're in discovering outdoor swimming for the first time. So it's been really exciting to be part of that as a, as a publisher and, and hearing so many people's stories and having the opportunity to share those stories. Um, I, I swim a lot myself. I, I've, um, well, before I started the magazine, I was a swimmer, um, done a little bit of triathlon as well and some swim run, but swimming has always been what I've come back to. Um, I, I swam up since I was four years old. Um, my mum used to take me to the sea and take us to lakes when I was a kid. And then, um, yeah, then I've just continued all my life. And uh, it's always something I come back to when I, it's just a, it's just such a great thing to, to have in your life. So I'm, I'm really lucky for that. And uh, just want to share that sort of love of swimming with everybody else. 
Thanks, Simon. And I know you started by saying that you haven't been to the Olympics, but you did go to the European champs, didn't you? I, 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 I've done some triathlon masters events as an age grouper. I went to a, a European champions championship, but as a, as a triathlete age grouper. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, more recently as a master swimmer, didn't you do uh, Yeah, I did. I did actually the masters in, at, uh, at the Olympic pool. Uh, exactly. I, think I, I think I came 19th. In the, in the <laughs> Excellent. <freestyle> in my <laughs> Excellent. <Right. laughs> okay. And the other thing that I'm just remembering is that if Greg shares some of his like sport relief challenge stories, Simon and I might have our own sport relief swimming story right. that we might want to share after six days on a bus together swimming around the UK. Um, but we'll save that for if we've got if we've got time at the end. Okay. What I'd like to start with because I think you'll all have an opinion on this is uh, where is outdoor swimming up to right now? So Simon, I know that Outdoor Swimmer has recently published a trends report in terms of um, you know the number of people that are swimming, what swimming means to them, and so on. So would you like to just sort of start us off with any key headlines from from that? insight into where we think the outdoor swimming is is up to because we know it's exploded yeah. even before the pandemic um but what are your thoughts yeah. on that uh, yeah so this is um, I, I haven't got that ready but it's it's handy so that's the report we've just done <laughs> um so thanks for th thanks for bringing that up that was a, a really fun piece of research to do actually we we had answers from 2500 swimmers something like that um so we were asking people what do they get out of out of swimming you know what what why do they do it what what do they like about it and something like i i can't remember the exact percentages but something like 70 percent of people are saying it was essential very important to their mental health and their general well-being and then we had one really interesting statistic was that of the people that started swimming last year 75 percent of them said they wanted to continue swimming throughout the winter which i thought was a, amazing for people coming new to outdoor swimming I mean, it's taken me 55 years to get to swimming outdoors in the winter and some people in their first year of swimming are, <laughs> are going out yeah and you know I think Carrie Ann's the same she's her she's been experimenting with winter swimming she's been in swimming all her life and that this is the first year she's really tried outdoor swimming in the winter so I think that's that's been a real revelation for a lot of people that you can keep swimming outside and um, the numbers are really hard to get hold of uh because you know, how do you count swimmers? They're all over the place. Um, Sport England do have got some numbers on this, but not for the period during COVID. Um, so we were looking at things like Google searches for outdoor swimming and, and talking to, to all the venues. Um, you know, the, the venues were all booked out. And I think a lot of them, I, your experience at West Reservoir, probably you could have sold your places five times over. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Huge, huge increase. So we, we think there's, probably at least a million people swimming regularly outdoors in open water and probably more but uh very difficult to count them yeah but but obviously we've seen that huge growth so Kerry Ann I was going to ask you about coaching but I'm going to start actually with your own personal experience then of winter mm -hmm. swimming <laughs> how yeah, was it been, how is it it's been it's been great actually I definitely have a few uh learnings that I've taken from my first year uh the first thing I guess being that when it gets less than seven degrees I don't really enjoy it so much anymore although there's this like yeah it's colder yeah and you should be experiencing this amazing feeling and it makes you go crazy but actually for me the after effects of going in anything less than seven degrees at the moment or somewhere around there it was just I, I am not experienced enough for that and I am more than happy to put my hands up and take my ego out of the equation and go you know what this isn't for me this is not the time for me I think maybe in a few years time I could get to that point but um I guess it's like someone saying I'm not going anywhere less than 20 degrees that's my like my cut off is seven basically <laughs> um so kind of learning that and, and being okay with that as soon as it's over that it's totally manageable and I can stay in for a bit and they're getting out bit it's still about getting changed really quickly and, and getting warm but it's not quite so wow um because it takes a long time for me to warm up uh, but I've really enjoyed it I've loved um I think for me one of the biggest parts is, is accountability actually and, and going with someone so my swimming buddy is, is Jonathan Cowie who's the current editor of Outdoor Swimming Magazine I'm super lucky to have someone so experienced in cold water swimming and winter swimming as my swimming buddy which is great because he's got such great insights and he understands it and 
he's there's no pressure from him either he's not like oh come on let's stay in a bit longer I quite often get in and I'm like okay I'm done now thank you very much it might only be like 45 seconds to maybe a minute if it's really cold and he's you know okay I'm just going to do a bit of swimming but we keep each other safe and we keep each other accountable by actually going especially on the days where it's not like stay nice and sunny when it's really cloudy and we actually don't want it um but to finish and round off my winter swimming experience I'm not gonna lie I'm ready for some sunshine <laughs> I am ready for some warm water I'm ready to actually put my face in the water now and stop doing head at fresh with my woolly hat on so I am totally ready uh to go forward with that and see see how we get on but those are my learnings so far thanks Kerry um, that resonates with me that sounds very much like my dips in the river with my friend as well much easier when the sun's shining um Greg, what advice would you give for people who are looking to make that transition from pool to outdoors? And, and does it need coaching or can you do it without, do you think? Well, I, I'm just going to what Kerry said there. It's really interesting because actually eight degrees C is the cutoff um, at the point at which what you do is you switch on the pain receptors at anything below eight degrees centigrade. So above, generally above that, it becomes an issue of two things. One is cold shock response, uh, which is always an issue, um, but it's about thermal comfort. Interestingly enough, once you get eight degrees C or below, all of a sudden it becomes a little bit painful. I'm sure Carrie Ann will describe that. But it's that. That's exactly that point it. <laughs> which, yeah, it's when the hands and the and the feet and particularly though the face, it just it hurts to put your face in the water. Yeah, until, the face and, doesn't go in. It until you've numbed it. <laughs> you can, you <laughs> no, numb it, though. It <laughs> Eventually you can't feel it and it's okay. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, I think the, the crucial thing, I think, for people who, who are going open water is that, that uh, to some extent, there are multiple things you have to think about. What, one is the fear factor, is that a, a lot of people are afraid of, of open water. A lot of people are afraid of cold water. Uh, and I think overcoming those, uh, firstly, is, is you know, really very important. I think overcoming them, when it comes to things like fear, it's just identifying what the fear is. I mean, there are lots of things that people worry about. You know, they worry about what's in the water. Uh, I can tell you there are very few great white sharks in the River Thames or in most, most ponds in the UK. Um, but people still worry about it. Um, and when you get touched by a stick, you, you know, that's when you see people freak. But I think, I think second to that is, is it's actually the way in which you do it. And I think what's really important about it is that you look at, at those ponds much like like better does you know that, that you look at those places where it is lifeguarded where it's, it is a formal swimming session uh, where there are people there to support you in that process of just acclimatizing to the environment really uh, and i think part of that acclimatization process exactly Karen just described is that what you want to go for might be there for five months you know, you don't have to go in and swim a tank. There isn't a black line to follow, you know, and, and obviously the side isn't that always that close to you. But outside of that, actually, just the skill of it, things like sighting, you have to look to see where you're going. Uh, all of those things alter economy in open water swimming. So it can make it feel much, much harder than it does in the pool. So I think acclimatizing it, getting familiar with the open water is the first thing to do. And, and, and do you need coaching? I think, to my mind, I think, yes. I mean, why, you know, I think there is a value to being coached, to being looked after, because what it does, it ticks all those boxes of fear and also then make sure that you engage in open water in such a way that you actually enjoy it. Because outside of everything we say today, the most important thing is that you enjoy doing it and you love it. The, the more you love it the more often you'll return and the more you'll get out from it so so i would say that the coaching at a designated center uh, and remaining safe are probably the paramount important things you're going to like yeah if i can add to that um that's such great points there and i think a lot of people think about coaching as something like a contract that you buy into and you have to do like 12 sessions and you don't need to think about it like that coaching can offer you the confidence that you need to take on whatever it is that you're taking on whether that's winter swimming um i know more swimmer triathlon all that kind of stuff that little bit of confidence can be gained by just one or two coach sessions so it doesn't have to be this like you know when you think about swimming lessons you think about putting your kids in for swimming lessons for like a term it doesn't need to be like that you might do that in the end but just a couple of sessions to help with your technique are you doing the right things and then 
decolonization to the different uh, things you have to deal with in the open water can make such a massive difference to someone's confidence. And it doesn't have to be, again, like I said, this long arbitrary thing that you have to sign up for. One, two sessions can make all the difference. Thanks, Carrie-Anne. Just add to, and I think that Carrie-Anne probably backed this up, that um, you might not even need to think of it as a, as a coach. I mean, the person mm. probably better, they, they may be, it's better if they're qualified as a coach, but it's almost more like they're a guide to, mm -hmm. to helping you just make those first steps and, and showing you through the process. It's not like a, a coach to say, okay, you're going to have to swim, you know, a mile and you're going to have to do it in this time. It's, it's nothing yeah. like that. It's just about, this is the, you know, this is, this is how you get the wetsuit on, or this is how you make the wetsuit fit so it's not going to fill up with water. And, and this is how you can get in safely. And, and you know, this is what's going to happen to you in the first 30 seconds you, that you're in the water. And, and don't panic because that happens to everybody. And it's, that, it's, a, it's more of a guiding than a, a coaching in, in many ways. And I, and I think a lot of the, and a lot of the coaches that carry has qualified are, are sort of that way inclined. Uh, mm -hmm. You're probably talking more, you know, they're, they're, what they are interested in doing is guiding people into outdoor swimming. So they have a really positive experience rather than coaching them for performance. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, that, that both exist and there's, there's a role for, for both. And I, I, it's probably worth when you, if you're starting checking what type of, coach you're working with and, and letting them know that this is what I want and hopefully matching yourself up with somebody who's who's coaching in the way that you want to be coached Definitely. yeah I, sorry Emma I, just one final thing on that was I always ask every coach when they start on the journey what is it that you're hoping to get out of this qualification and I'd say probably about 70 percent um, which is a high number 70 percent say they want to pass their passion on of open water swimming so you know, there's only maybe 30% saying I'm desperate to kind of really help people take on marathon swims or massive triathlons. So a huge part of that is our people wanting to just pass their, their passion on to other people in a safe way. And I think that's a really good point, Kerry Ann, because what every good coach, guide, whatever should be asking every swimmer is what do they want to get out of it as well? And, you know, every everybody's on a journey. We're all at different stages of the journey. When I first got into open water, the thing that kept me back was getting a wetsuit was my biggest. It wasn't the getting in the water. So everybody has different barriers to doing it and they're at different stages of the journey. And a good coach or guide will will help them progress on that on that journey. Um, and that's probably a good point for me to say that there was a question that came up around where they're going to be any coach sessions in any of in any of our facilities. And we are um, as, as well as her as well as her uh, Olympic background, Kerry Ann is also our fitness swimming ambassador for better. Um, and France up our swim doctor program, which is our adult um, coaching program. And we will be looking to roll out those swim doctor sessions with some people who have already qualified with Kerry Ann and people who will go on to to complete her open water coaching course um, and we will be rolling that out initially in our outdoor facilities and then also into more indoor facilities okay I want to talk acclimatization Greg you did touch on it but there was a specific question around you know coaching aside how do we get ourselves ready for getting into cold water and I know that extreme extreme temperature is is your bag so can you maybe take us through through that yeah, without any shadow of a doubt, I think you know probably the, the biggest physiological barrier to open water swimming is 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 getting used to the cold. Um, and, and one of the things that we have is we have two responses when we get into water. We have this one thing that, which is called the mammalian dive response, um, and and it, that is best demonstrated with those that have got babies or had babies or seen the front cover of the Nirvana album, where what you can do with babies is you can actually put them under water. Uh, and what the, there's a particular nerve in their cheeks. And what they do is they recognize submersion. We recognize uh, submersion. And what we do is we close the glottis over the trachea. I won't bore you with this, but basically we, that, that, what that does is it stops uh, water being inhaled into the lungs. Uh, and, and actually what it also does is, is it, it, it's what's called a vagal maneuver. It calms everything down. So it's amazing. We did it with my kids. They've never forgiven me, but uh, we've got these great photos of them where we shoved them underwater as babies. Um, and, and they, you know, you've seen the, the front cover of Nirvana where they just sort of seem to float and respond. So, so th there is that mammalian dive response. Equally, what you get in cold water is you get this cold shock response. Now, the mammalian dive response, very positive. Cold shock response, 
could be wholly negative. So I have to be very careful about that. And effectively what that is, is it's our immediate response to exposure to cold water, to cold. Um, and, and amongst other things, one thing that we do do is we start to hyperventilate. So you get that gasp, you get an immediate gasp on entry. So you go, <gasps> as soon as you get in, and then what you do is you hyperventilate following that. Now that's the real issue. And we have to be very, very careful of that because in fact, we, you only have to inhale around about half a liter uh, of fluid to start the drowning process. Uh, and if you consider when you're hyperventilating, you're probably ventilating circa 100 liters a minute. You can see how quickly you can take on that fluid. Now that's made worse in sea conditions because you've got waves which are then hitting you and also salt water, the salinity of the water makes a difference. So the key that we need to do is just make sure that we recognize that, number one. But crucially, what we can do is we can overcome that. And we overcome that with something we call habituation, getting, basically getting used to it. Um, and in fact, you only need around about five, three minute exposures to cold water to dampen that cold shock response. Um, and, so, and, and so therefore what you can do before going to an open water facility, actually just uh, experiencing cold water at home uh, will actually dampen that response and will mean that when you get into the cold open water, it will be much lower. Now, interestingly enough, you can do that with just face covering. It doesn't have to be whole body. So you can do that with just cold water on the face. Um, it works a little bit better if you go whole body um, because the, the response is just that little bit more driven. Um, so things like cold showers and cold baths can be really valuable in acclimatizing, acclimating as it would technically be called, prior to going to swim in open water. And you can really dampen that cold shock response down. Um, so it, the one thing I would do is, is make sure that people understand that, understand that you are going to get this response. There's nothing to worry about. It does get better over time. Um, and then secondary to that, I think, is just recognize what's happening when you're in the water and when you get out of the water. <clears throat> water itself is 25 times more conductive than air. What that effectively means, it, it will strip heat very, very rapidly. In other words, you cool very rapidly in cold open water. The more you move, the more heat you generate, the less likely you are to cool. Okay, so the thing about open water swimming is that basically when you get into the water, the, the, the thing that you should be doing is start swimming. As soon as you, that cold shock response is, is dampened, is you want to be moving as quickly as you can. What you don't want to do is treading water or standing in, in, in water for long periods of time before you do anything. Um, the more you move, the more heat you generate, the better it is. And then crucially, when you get out of the water, um, what, what we get is this, this thing called the after drop. We've all experienced it. Uh, and if you ever watch me, I still do it now. Um, and that is that what happens is, is that whilst in swimming, we can maintain core body temperature, our body temperature. What happens when we get out of water is we are not swimming anymore. So we're not generating heat, but also we start to perfuse these cold, the blood starts to redivert to cold areas of the body. And so what we see is we see a precipitous, a very rapid drop in core body temperature. Uh, now that can be really problematic. And it's why when, you get, when you're in the water, you don't shiver. When you get out of the water within minutes, all of a sudden you've got this uncontrollable shiver. Um, that's trying to generate heat for you. So the key to that really is to make sure that you prepare for exit. And in preparing for exit, what you are doing is you are drying quickly, you are replacing clothing quickly. Uh, and on top of that, we can use warm fluids. And I say warm, not hot fluids, warm fluids uh, to, to improve that response. So it, to some extent, it is just about planning. And I think if you plan it every step of the way, what you can do is you can reduce the negative impact, improve the positive impact and have a, and have a better experience. Thanks, Greg. Um, there's a couple of people that are asking that are first time wetsuit users. Um, first of all, um, any experience from the group in terms of getting from um, if you're going outdoors, first time wetsuit user, should I be wearing a swimsuit underneath and do I need multiple swimsuits underneath my wetsuit? I, Simon? Should I go first? Um, yeah. I, I, I normally wear a wetsuit. Uh, this, this year is the first year I've been swimming a lot without a wetsuit. Um, I always wear a costume underneath my wetsuit, just one. Um, I, I know I've got a friend who doesn't because what I quite often do is I swim for a bit in my wetsuit and then take my wetsuit off and then swim a bit without. 
and I invited my friend to take off his wetsuit and he said, mm, maybe not today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's totally up to you. I'm, I'm more comfortable having a, a, a pair of trunks underneath my wetsuit. I know some people, um, if it's particularly cold, they might put on an extra layer underneath. Um, uh, some people wear a tri suit underneath. Um, I have experimented once when I've been testing kit wearing um, something like a rash vest underneath, which is nice and snug. Um, it does feel a bit more restricted for your swimming. Um, but if you if you want to stay in a bit longer and you, you don't mind being a bit restricted in your in your movement and you and the cold is what's really bugging you or bothering you, then there's no reason why you can't put on an extra layer underneath your wetsuit but just bear in mind that then everything does feel very tight um, and then when you get the cold water shop which you still get even with a wetsuit you've got that additional constriction around your chest and um, which may if you're not expecting it or not ready for it it, it may sort of cause you know provoke a sort of panic response so you just need to be a little bit aware of when you're wearing a wetsuit that you do have that extra constriction and it may feel like it that, that your breathing is restricted. It's not really, but it, it kind of feels like it. And, and the whole cold water shock response combined with that constriction around your chest can, can sort of, well, yeah, it could trigger you to panic, which is, I think is one of the reasons why going with a guide or a coach for your first time and just letting them talk you through that um, is a really good idea. Yeah, some really good stuff there, um, Simon. I guess one of the first things to mention um, about this, you know, I was a, an Olympic swimmer, an open water swimmer. The rules for us at the time while I was swimming was that wetsuits weren't allowed. So I guess there's an assumption that if you're from that era um, or from maybe the channel swimming era or, you know, doing channel swimming, which there, again, there are rules um, on that, they're all starting to change. But ultimately, we're all about getting people into the open water. So I think people just need to get rid of their um, this worry about wearing wetsuits and is it cheating, is it not cheating? I couldn't care less. Well, I could care less. I think I want you to wear something. Something's probably better than nothing, but each to their own, I guess. But it doesn't matter while you're in the open water. Like if you want to go swimming in the autumn or maybe now that it's coming up to springtime, wear a wetsuit and do what Simon did. You know, maybe the last two minutes, take your wetsuit off so you can experience that, that the thrill of being in the cold and your body will acclimatize to that over certain time periods. And I guess to Simon's extent with the cold water shock thing, how I usually notice if someone is having a, you know, a, a panicked reaction to cold water shock is usually people grabbing at their wetsuits going, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, oh, it feels really like that. So it's just, again, being aware and knowing what cold water shock is, everyone gets it. Still to this day, I get it as well. And to me, it looks like I go, Oh, 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 it's really cold. Whose idea was this? That's usually my response. It's usually my idea, but I'm the one going, whose idea was this? This is a bad idea. But once you get over that, which, you know, Greg didn't necessarily mention earlier, but cold water shots usually only last around about two minutes. If you deal with it, if you don't deal with it, it will, it will last much longer. Um, but you just got to kind of calm the body down, fill the lungs for a little bit on those two minutes and then, and then get going. So wearing wetsuits, I think are, you know totally fine and people if you want to wear them and then you go actually I don't need it maybe next time I won't wear one great again you're swimming that's all I really care about is that people are actually in the water swimming um and I would always for me personally I, again I would always wear a swimming suit underneath my wetsuit but I think that might just be because of our swimming backgrounds I, I genuinely think that's probably just because I've, I was a swimmer if you've never really worn a swimsuit before you might be going well what's the point of wearing a swimsuit if I've got a wetsuit on um, I don't know. I just feel more secure for some reason, which sounds completely ridiculous, but that's my mindset me, anyway. Me too. And I agree with Simon. Once the weather starts changing, the water temp comes up. It's about making that transition to taking it off for the last five mm. minutes and things. So, yeah. you know, maybe it's just a modesty thing. I assumed you had to. I didn't even, I'd never thought about <laughs> putting a wetsuit on without one. Um, there are some questions about recommendations for first time wetsuits. And I'll be honest, I don't really want us to get into brands here. However, what I think we could talk about is what makes a good fitting wetsuit? What should people be looking out for? Um, and there's also a question around, is there any other equipment that we would be advising? Should you be looking to wear a neoprene vest underneath your wetsuit? So, Greg, do you want to start us off on that one? Well, it's, an, it's always an interesting question. I think the first thing to remember here is that it's more is not always better 
just because you're spending a lot of money doesn't make it the right wetsuit for you. I think what you've got to do is make sure you, you're getting the right wetsuit. I think probably the first thing and the most important thing is that what, what you are trying to do with this wetsuit is swim. Uh, and so therefore buying a, a, a wetsuit that, it, that is manufactured for swimming is really important. And people often look at me weirdly when I say that, but there is a big difference between a windsurfing wetsuit, a surfing wetsuit and a swimming wetsuit. Um, and if you're as old as me, you can remember back to the days when I, I raced in triathlon in the late 80s and we swam in, in surfing wetsuits and boy, is it difficult to do. Um, so what, what we tend to get nowadays is that the, the arms uh, are much thinner because it enables uh, a, a, an easier rotation of the arm. Generally, you're looking at somewhere in the region about three mil of, of thickness on that three millimeters of thickness. Uh, and, and on the body where you're looking for a little bit more buoyancy, but particularly on the legs where you're looking for more buoyancy, if you're new to swimming, uh, you, you can get a various grading scales of that. Generally, I mean, I, I swim in a three five. So, so it's a three mil and a five mil body and leg. Um, I don't need the buoyancy quite so much. Some people like a seven mil. Once you get above seven, it's it's really buoyant and it's it's counterproductive. So I think first off, make sure you buy a swimming wetsuit, not a standard, not, not a windsurfing wetsuit. Um, I think lots of companies now will allow you to try their wetsuits on. I mean, I think, you know, going to some of the, the some of the, uh, going to the, um, the expos is a great thing to do because what you get is the opportunity to try some of those wetsuits on. And actually many of them have got flumes at these expos now and you can actually have a swim with them. Um, but you, you can get demo models where you can try it on and have a fit with it. Because it is, it is actually about making sure you get the, the right size and the, the fit of the wetsuit is absolutely crucial. If you get something with too short a body, particularly for the men, let me tell you, it will cause havoc, absolute havoc, if the body is too short. Um, I, I don't, you, you don't need me to describe that. Um, so, I mean, but get, getting the right fit is absolutely crucial. So, so what I would say is swimming wetsuit. You definitely, I mean, you can be paying, you know, up to upwards of 800 pounds plus for a wetsuit. You do not need to spend that on an entry level wetsuit. Um, and, and cheaper is not going to be any less, any, you know, it's, it's not going to be detrimental to your performance. Um, but if you can, if you have got the opportunity, try it on first before you buy and it'll make sure you get the right fit. Yeah, definitely. The only thing I'd add to that on a wetsuit fit is that ultimately for swimming, it does need to be tight a lot of people oh, yeah. i think go a size up because they think oh it feels quite tight i feel restricted but the last thing you want from a wetsuit is water to go in either the front or if you're doing front crawl water to go down the back because then it's a balloon basically and then you end up swimming with water in the wetsuit ideally with the wetsuit you only want a thin layer of water through the wetsuit so that's how they work essentially is that water needs to go in the wetsuit so that the skin can warm that water and then the neoprene keeps it warm so that's how and why wetsuits keep us warm so we want a little bit of water in there but if it's constantly being filled and ballooning with loads of water it's not going to be very helpful so you do want to make sure that it feels snug maybe not like if you feel super restricted and you feel like you can't breathe maybe it is a bit too tight um the other things you're looking for is when you try it on is to make sure that it's really it really fits under your armpits a lot of people get that wrong and you can see sorry i'm not saying the right but it's like down down there that's not going to be helpful for swimming at all because again water is just going to pool in there so you want it to you want for ladies you want it to feel like leggings basically it's got to be tight it's got to feel nice and snug and then same sort of thing up top I guess just to make sure you really feel because that's how you're going to swim nicely through the water and keep you warm as soon as there's it's too big water's going to go everywhere but like Greg was saying loads of places now are because there's so many on the market, loads want you to, to try it first, at least so that there's a chance that you'll buy it. Um, some places even do like a wetsuit hire for a season or a month or something. So you can hire the wetsuit for a month, try it out. If you don't like it, send it back. Just do some research on it. But I think, you know, you don't need to spend, like Greg was saying, 800 pounds on a brand new wetsuit. If you're going entry level, make sure it's a swim specific one. And by that, we mean it's a little shinier on the, on the surface of it. If you, if you have ever worn a surf wetsuit before you know it's a bit matte on the top you're looking for something that feels a bit shiny a bit smoother um and you know i'd say a decent 150 200 maybe even 100 pounds to 200 pounds in entry level wetsuit would be perfect for your first couple of seasons just take care of it because it is a bit like wearing tights more than leggings i guess is that you you could ladder it in a way you could stick your finger through it and stuff so just keep good care of it 
and that will last you could last you you know two seasons and um, if you're really careful maybe even a third season with that as well thank you i mean it definitely should be like a second skin really shouldn't it um uh, right uh, simon have you got any quick points on that because i'm yeah. as, because of the, of the magazine i'm lucky enough to have a have a collection of wetsuits so i've got different wetsuits for different purposes um that we get i get them into tests so if i'm if i'm racing i like to have a wetsuit with with really thin arms so there are there are some brands out there with sort of one and a half two millimeters on the arms but if i'm casual swimming with my friends and it's still chilly i can't bear it because it's just too cold so you know i wear one with a really thin arms for for racing in warmer water and then i wear a different one if i'm just you know, swimming with, with, you know, just going out for a casual swim with a bit more, a bit more protection on the arms. And if I'm sort of, you know, scrambling about over rocks and messing about in pools or something like that, I'd, I'd use something else with a bit more sort of protection. You know, if I'm, like if I'm doing swim run, for example, you'd get a, spe a specific one for that, but they tend to have a sort of rougher finish around them. So, but, you know, think it, just think about what type of swimming you're going to be using it for. Uh, but uh, the cheaper ones are often warmer than the more expensive ones, warmer and more buoyant. So um, you might, you know, you might be tempted to, to pay more if you, you know, maybe if you're in the lucky position that you can, and you think I'm going to get a better wetsuit, but it might not be better for what you want it for. If you want something that's going to keep you warm and buoyant, the cheaper ones will often do that better than the performance ones, which are, which are designed around speed and tend not to keep you so warm. And they're also more fragile. Thanks, Simon. Whilst we've got you, um, can I just ask you as well to expand on if you've got any advice on hats and goggles for outdoor swimming? <laughs> just if you if you would be if you would advise a particular style of goggle um, or no, on goggles, um, I mean, I because I wear glasses um, and I don't like to wear contact lenses when I'm swimming. Yeah, I mean you all the opticians will advise against it. So I tend to use prescription goggles. So my choice on goggles is limited to what I can get as prescription goggles, mainly. Um, so the, the goggles I use in open water are the same as the ones I use in the pool. Uh, and, and I get on just fine with those. And I'm they're, 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 they're sort of medium sized uh, goggles. They're nothing special except for their prescription goggles so that I can see. Um, but I, you know, people wear all sorts of, the most important thing is you're comfortable wearing them and you know some people when it, the water's really cold they like the big mask because it covers more of the face some people just prefer that anyway because they can see better um people that grew up in swimming pools you know someone like you know colin hill for example he wore the little swedish goggles that you know squeeze your eyeballs out and he wore those to swim the channel <laughs> so it, personal preference very comfy they are comfy I no, agree with it. so yeah it's, it's preferences you carry on like those and i can't bear them <laughs> um i mean it's swim hat i normally you know a silicon hat is slightly warmer um, than a than a latex one they're a bit more durable um some people wear two hats if it's particularly cold and you know you can also get neoprene hats as well um which can help against that sort of ice cream freeze. And some of them also have flaps that come over your, your cheeks as well. So, um, you know, a bit more comfort, you can wear a neoprene hat. And then what I tend to do, because they're, they're often black, I tend to put then a bright cap over the top of them to, because that's obviously a, a key thing is about being seen in the water. So, so a bright hat, goggles you're comfortable with, and uh, that's it. Good stuff. Only thing I could add to the goggle front from an open water perspective is that if it's sunny, um, and as more and more people are probably going to take it up swimming again as, as the water gets a bit warmer, as does the ones that have been swimming for the winter, if you can get um, a pair of goggles that you're comfortable with that might that might be either mirrored or a bit darker, it tends to make it a little easier, especially if there's glare and you can see a little bit more, a bit like sunglasses, think of them like sunglasses. If you, you know, you'd walk down the street on that day with sunglasses, you might want to wear goggles that are a bit darker, either mirrored, there's ones that have like a mirrored lens like sunglasses or ones that are polarised same sort of thing really but Simon's right comfort is is number one priority when it comes to that kind of stuff yeah I, I'd agree with the um the mirrored ones as well um certainly swimming in summer evenings it doesn't it's not even about if it's a summer day it's about if you're hitting a sunrise and a sunset and you're doing mm -hmm. a loop and you know you're you, you're trying to spot your markers and you can't see for the sun so I think it is that's a, a really valid point Greg is there anything you want to add around uh, around the hats and goggles particularly around that sort of keeping the heat in from a hat point of view well do you know I mean it's probably additional equipment 
um, all told, because I, I think often a lot of the questions that people often ask me are things like hats, uh, hats gloves and booties. Yes, you someone know, should, has should... that about the wet socks. So let's okay, cover great, those yeah. so, as well. You know, should, should you wear hats, gloves and booties? I think, you know, the most, and, it, and it, th this strikes back, uh, uh, and it's an old chestnut for me. It's the one thing that really does inflame me is this uh, snobbery around the fact you can only be an open water swimmer if you do it in skins. Uh, and let me tell you now, publicly, that is an absolute load of nonsense. Okay. Open Agreed. water swimming. Open water swimming is when you swim in open water. Whether you've got a wetsuit on, whether you've got whether you've got budgie smugglers on, or if you're naked, it's all swimming and it's all open water. And I think, you know, what drives that is confidence and comfort and enjoyment. And if if you enjoy wearing a wetsuit, you carry on wearing a wetsuit. It's as simple as that. Um, for me, I, you know, it, it's horses for courses. It just depends what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it for. Um, and actually for some things, you know, if I'm racing triathlon, you have to wear them at, at certain temperatures. So I think, you know, there is a value to doing both actually, because then it gives you that flexibility. Um, when it comes to hats, gloves and booties, I think a neoprene hat, I would say is definitely something you want in your kit bag. Um, you can actually now get really lovely, lovely balaclavas, which cover sort of full, full head uh, and, and throat. Um, again, what I would say with those is, is give them a try before you buy, um, because some people find them a bit claustrophobic when they wear them. Um, but certainly a neoprene hat should be definitely in your kit bag. Booties and gloves. Um, let, let's go booties first. I think booties can be valuable. I mean, often what people complain about, particularly when you get out from very cold water, is hands and feet. Uh, because what I won't bore you with the physiology, but what you're doing is you're ch changing the speed at which um, the speed at which the nerves work to some extent, the wiring works. And once they get very cold, it becomes very difficult. So you lose dexterity. And it's why things like zips and buttons after you've been cold, open water swimming are not a good thing. So you, like that, going back to that clothing, get things that you can just throw on rather than you have to zip up or button up. Um, but I think, you know, booties also work well if you're getting into when you're getting into water rather than barefoot so it depends if you're going in via a stony beach or you're coming in via the bank in the river um so i'm not i'm not personally adverse to a pair of booties i don't you know i think if, if you need it then i would go for it um gloves on the other hand i'm not a big fan of gloves i do wear them um but it's only when water temperature gets to about five degrees c so just pre-freezing really uh, and at that point it's because of what i'm going to it's because of dexterity more than anything else i think the problem with gloves is that unless you've got a very very good glove very well fitted it will negatively impact your swimming it feels completely different you lose complete feel in the water um but i think as we've said with all of this it's horses for courses so neoprene hat tick booties tick gloves very much a personal choice my current swimwear is i wear a swimsuit and booties well not booties they're, they're like swimming socks actually and it's purely for me it's purely to get in and out um because i'm swimming in the river at the minute it's purely to get in and out of the river and not hurt myself on something so i i have raynards and um, so my feet and my hands and feet get really cold really quickly and i just can't feel anything so that's what i wear when i go swimming currently there's there's actually a specific question that's been asked, Carrie Ann, about um, any advice for someone with Reynards in terms of looking after those elements. Do you, is there anything else you can add to that? Yeah, so I had to learn again through the winter. I mean, I've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence and people talking about I used to have Reynards or I have Reynards, but my first sort of three seasons in, in the cold water were brutal because my hands were really sore. But I've seen an improvement of that. So that's one of the reasons why I did want to start winter swimming, because I'm hoping to kind of I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that it does really help my Reynolds in the future. So I'll, I'll persevere for a couple of years with it. Um, but I had to look into things because if I get in the water too cold, if I get in and I've already got cold hands, so Reynolds for me looks like like a finger or a couple of fingers will just go white, completely white, lose, you know, lose all feeling in it and toes as well, that kind of stuff. If I get into the water cold, the after effects are completely brutal and I did I'm ashamed to say it because I'm I'm a you know I qualify coaches for a living um I did push it too far one day it was actually it was New Year's Day I went into the water I was cold before I got in and I had a bit of nerve damage on the end of my fingertips for about three days four days afterwards um which did really scare me and I think that's a really important thing to mention and why I'm mentioning it because it did really scare me and I'm experienced in talking about this and doing the right things and getting people to think about the right things in the aftercare and all that kind of stuff. I was just cold getting in. So first thing, 
do whatever you need to to make sure that your hands are not cold, hands and feet are not cold before you get in. So hanging around with no gloves on and, you know, for 10 minutes before having a chit chat, not a good idea. The second thing for me was when I do get out, it's about kind of doing what I can as quickly as I can to get gloves on. So that means I have to re- very quickly kind of get my, my dry rub on and, and zip myself up and then get my swimsuit off um, and then stick some gloves on. And can I get changed with, with the gloves on essentially? So getting them on as quick as I can. And the other thing that was a complete game changer for me um, halfway through my season was what I do now is I take a water bottle, just a normal drinks bottle that, I, that I've had. And I put um, probably like that much cold water in it. And then the rest I fill up with hot water from uh, from the kettle essentially so not basically the only reason I put cold water in is that I don't melt it um, and I take that in a little flask and I take that with me and I just hold on to that at the end so I'm not it's not too hot it's not too warm again because there's a bit of, of um, a little bit of cold water in there so it's sort of warm uh, water I don't put the water on my hands I haven't done that yet although I've heard people talk about that but I just hold it um, with the gloves on as well so there's another layer between that and that really helps me to not go too far down the Raynard symptoms Toes, on the other hand, I haven't worked out anything for my toes yet. They still get really cold <laughs> and I can, I just have to deal with the, the after effects of those. But that's pretty much what's worked really well for me. The complete game changer for me has been taking a, a water bottle and, and just holding onto it like a, like, a, like a hot water bottle, essentially. It's exactly what it is, I guess. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've been so busy talking. I'm aware we've, uh, we've only got nine or ten minutes left. So I, I want to move us on. And I'm, I'm keen to, to get into here to just let you all know which facilities better will actually be opening on the 29th of March because there's been, there's been a number of questions. So West Reservoir in Hackney will be reopening. Stanborough Park Lake, which is just outside Welling Garden City, will be reopening. Hillingdon Lido, which is an unheated Lido, um, part of the Hillingdon Sports Complex that will be opening earlier than normal on the 29th of March um, and the other unheated facility that will be opening is Jesus Green Lido in Cambridge and um, that one is not opening until the 2nd of April just so that you're aware it's a it's a couple of days later um, but again open earlier than it than it normally would be in the season um, and then the heated facilities, we've got the outdoor pool at Oasis Sports Centre in Holborn in central London, London Fields Lido in Hackney and Charlton Lido in Blackheath in, in Greenwich. So those are the ones that we're going to be opening. And um, what I would like to just touch on is how safe we think that is. Um, and I, I want to take you through um, some of the, the some of the things that we've put in place um, to make sure that from a COVID point of view, you're safe when you come back. Many of you I know will have already been attending these facilities and we're probably in in the Lido's daily prior to Christmas. Um, but we will keep you safe when you if you haven't been and you don't know the journey, there may well be an entirely new customer journey around the facility and it will be a one-way journey um, so that you are socially distanced throughout you'll book your swim in advance on on the app tickets are available seven days in advance so the tickets for the 29th will go live on the 22nd of march in the evening um, and you'll be able to book those in advance whether you're a member or whether you are, are not a member yet you just need to download the better app um, come into the facility, you will scan your barcode of the ticket that you've purchased and then you'll follow the signage around the building. If you've not been during COVID times, you may find that the route is different to normal. You do need to be pool ready. And this is the same for indoor pools when they reopen. Put your stuff on underneath. I think a lot of us that are outdoor swimmers are fairly used to this. Um, and as we've said, another reason for having your swimsuit on underneath your wetsuit. Um, but make sure you're pool ready and then you're going to be able to get in quickly. It will be clear where to leave your belongings when you come in um, and have your swim. You'll be um, limited in terms of capacity in the lanes that you're in so that there's not too many people. Um, and there, should, there will be really clear guidance about what you can and can't do. And the lifeguards are there to, to support you. Um, there's been lots of comments in the chat already about how well looked after people felt, at, particularly at places is like West Res and Charlton and you know that makes me really happy because I know the teams work really really hard to achieve that and ultimately they want you to enjoy the experience they want you to tell your friends and they want you to come back so you know we're always keen keen to hear that feedback and it is likely that you may well end up leaving through a different door that you arrive through so it's a completely one-way journey that keeps you as safe as possible 
we're not doing any group activities at the moment for adults because that's not um, not permitted. Um, so every ticket is a single uh, single booking. So those of you that swim with swimming clubs, you'll find that from from an adult perspective, your swimming clubs won't be able to make group bookings. But there's nothing to stop you making individual uh, bookings. You will be allocated a certain amount of time in a facility from front door to leaving, and it's an hour from 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 um, from my perspective, and that includes your your whole journey. I appreciate some of you may want to swim longer than that. I'm guessing in the heated facilities, not the unheated ones at the moment. Um, but unfortunately, to ensure that we provide as much opportunity as possible, that's what it's limited to at the moment, to make sure that we can get as many people um, swimming as possible. Um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of insight into how the facilities are going to work. Um, and there's lots of information on our website. And I've shared the link in the chat if anybody wants to go and have a look and just check out. But I would say always check the social media and the website of any facility, whether it's ours or anyone else's, because obviously outdoor facilities are also um, beholden to the weather. Um, and sometimes that changes at short notice and, and we have to close for, for short periods of time. So always check before you swim even if you've got a ticket booked, really. Um, what I just wanted to touch on whilst I'm talking about safety and keeping you safe, um, Greg, do we feel that that sort of leisure centre, swimming pool, outdoor pool environment is a safe space for people to be during the pandemic at the moment? What are your thoughts on that? So um, I led on the group that devised all of those guidelines that you're talking about so with UK Active so I've been liaising with SAGE number 10 DCMS PHE for what feels like a lifetime <laughs> I can't tell you um, I, I think you know the bottom line is this is an aerosolizing uh, uh, virus uh, and so therefore social distancing remains the, the real mainstay in terms of reducing uh, contraction of the virus and spreading of the virus um, I think the important thing about swimming pools, and this is an argument I've had with uh, with uh, both the chief medical officer and deputy chief medical officer for some time now, is that the coronavirus does not exist in chlorinated water. Um, and so that includes, I mean, effectively what you are doing is you're swimming in a vat of bleach. Uh, so coronavirus doesn't exist in the water. Most swimming pools are washed down continually on the sides uh, by chlorinated water. So therefore it won't exist on the sides either. Um, there is still a touch risk. Um, and so we, we still need to think about those sanitation procedures, particularly when you're coming into the facility. So it's making sure that you are sanitizing when you come in, uh, remaining socially distant. Uh, that is both on the side and in the pool, uh, I think is absolutely crucial. But the bottom line is that actually swimming pools, um, you know, if you want me to point in common parlance, it's a, a damn sight safer than a supermarket. Thank you. Um, OK, we are coming up to the end of, uh, of the of the last couple of minutes that we've got left now. So I'm just going to sort of pass around the group quickly. Kerry Ann is there. What one top tip would you give for outdoor swimmers? And I'm going to come around um, the group on this. Perfect. There was two actually two, two questions that I was just looking for the Q&A, um, which actually lead into the top tip that I was talking about now is um, someone was asking around um how can you find a coach so i would definitely say head to the best website and find coaches for the pools that are open because there will be people there you can do one-to-one -one personal training if you think of open water coaching as the same thing but if you if you can't um we've literally just launched a coach finder on our on our website so if you wanted to look for a coach maybe you're the south coast or somewhere around there that you you can't get access to a better center for right now but you still want to take that step into open water just head to straight line swimming um, or google straight line swimming will pop up and there's a coach find there the other question was uh, that someone had mentioned so last may i did a, a video saying um you know in the pandemic if you haven't uh if you don't know how to swim or haven't swam in the open water um now isn't the time to learn how to do it and i still stand by that um but what we do know now is that with social distancing it's far safer to be on a one-to-one -one basis with a swimming coach helping you so that was the thing coaching wasn't allowed at the time where it is now we are allowed that one-to-one -one environment and, and soon a one-to-five environment where you can go into the open water with a qualified coach that can help you through that process and understand all those new um all the issues that you need to deal with like cold water shock and all that kind of stuff because the water's still cold right now 
And so being able to kind of do those sorts of things. So for me, my number one tip is if you're nervous or you're worried or you just feel like you need a little bit of confidence, reach out to a coach and just get some confidence and some help. Again, it doesn't have to be for a year. It can just be for one or two sessions. So for me, that's the best and quickest way for you guys to get confidence in the open water and and come and join the party because it's fun. You're going to love it once you take it up. Thanks, Kerry ann Simon? Yeah, so I, what I was thinking is normally in, in, in normal times, I swim in a swimming pool, heated swimming pool through the winter, and then I come to outdoor swimming in, in about April. And every single year, it's it's a real shock with the cold. Um, and the first couple of sessions are really hard. It hurts my, I, I, I would always wear a wetsuit at that time of year. It hurts my hands, it hurts my face, it hurts my feet. But it, it really just takes one or two swims and then it then, you know, the water tends to be warming up quite quickly at that time of year as well. Just takes one or two swims of getting used to the temperature again. So, you know, if if it feels really, really cold the first time, don't go away thinking, my God, water, the water's too cold. I can never do this again. Give it two or three times as the water's warming up and it will feel 100 percent better and it will, it will soon feel absolutely amazing. And the second thing specifically for this year, if you're anything like me, your fitness has probably taken a huge dive uh, during lockdown. Um, I'm not anticipating getting back to swimming and swimming at the same speed and swimming the same distances I was doing before lockdown. Um, I'm planning to take some time to, uh, to build fitness back again steadily over the, over the summer when we can swim again. That's a really so valid point. Yeah, thanks, Simon. That's that's really, really valid, that one. I think we all need to remember that. Um, Greg, we'll finish off with you. Top tips? Well, I mean, my single top tip, which is the golden rule, that which you should never, ever break, and that is never swim alone, ever. Uh, and I, I, I don't care what else you do, <laughs> but you never, ever swim alone. Uh, and, and I think it, what that then points towards is actually getting a coach, going to a, a, a guarded facility, going to an organized swim with other people, all of that will fall into place. So all, all of those really important points about your safety will fall into place if you never swim alone. And I think that's absolutely key. And I think that uh, what Simon's just said is absolutely bang on. Uh, I've, I've just written a piece for 220 magazine and they said, you know, what should we be thinking about? And I said, well, look, imagine, imagine you've been injured or ill and you're returning back to swimming following that. And that's the attitude you need to take is it's a progressive approach. You will definitely, even if you've kept fit throughout lockdowns, uh, you will have lost swimming condition because we haven't been doing as much swim as we have. So come back gradually, progress uh, gradually, and you'll have a far more enjoyable. What, the last thing you wanna do is get back in the water, smash it out and pick up an injury because then you'll spend another couple of months out of the water. So progress nice and slowly. Uh, and enjoy it. And most importantly of all, enjoy it. Fantastic. Thank you. I don't think I can follow that other than to say there is so much information out there, starting with the website links that I've shared in the Q&A and in the chat for you um, to find out about our facilities. But just in general, in terms of outdoor swimming, one of the participants made a good point. There's some great Facebook groups um, out there if you want more information and and people like yourselves, there's always someone else in the same boat. So, so uh, you know, just reach out and ask those questions and you will find the information information open water and outdoor swimming must be one of the most googled things in the last 12 months i would i would say um, so it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Kerry ann to greg and to simon for joining us today i hope you agree with me it's been a really really beneficial session um, could have talked for hours but we're going to have to call it a day there so thank you everybody and i will be uh sharing the the recording with everybody that that registered so thank Thanks, everybody, and um, see you next time. Thank you for the invite. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. You. Enjoy.